I build programs which are designed to build a better world so that we still have a world that'll be here to future generations. And when they inherit it, it'll be worth something meaningful to them and they'll be able to do great things with it. A movement of wealth creation, wealth being all things that are good and positive. Your health is a form of wealth. Your happiness is a form of wealth. Your ability to celebrate life is a form of wealth, but it translates through the material, physical, and spiritual world in that way. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. This is certainly one of the longest episodes of Ecomonics to date, and is as significant as they come. As you listen, you'll notice I don't say much. Part of that is, unfortunately, we were experiencing a latency delay, making it difficult to time any interjection, but also because, frankly, my guest today, Greg Halpern, speaks with such residence, it's impossible not to want to just hush up and listen. So that's what I did. Greg moves about into multiple subjects, ranging from his life advancement program, the Formula 4 Protocol, of which they gave me some samples of, and I'm going to speak about that afterwards, his audio enhancement software, Max D, but also key moments that revolutionized his business as well as his life's ultimate mission. And his life is an experience unlike any other. It's a privilege to share in some of that. So do as I did. Open your mind and prepare to rethink a lot of what you know. Greg Halpern, it is an honor to have you here on Ecomonics. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for reaching out to us to want to do this show. It's, it's great to have you here. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? I'm doing amazing, fantastic, wonderful, and a little bit spectacular. How about yourself? I, I'm, in, I'm in a great place. Uh, I, I have no issue with being you know, as transparent as you know, we, we can be on the show, which is quite, um, which is that when I saw what you, what you do, it made me realize something about this show is that you know, there, it would be great to talk to, I don't know, to sh- people on, on TV shows and, and, and movie celebrities, you know, the people that we're, we're, we're fans of in that way. But I realized that on this show, we are talking to the real movers and shakers of planet Earth. And you are by far, you've set the bar. And I am, uh, I, you know, we'll, we'll see if anybody can, can match that. I'm not saying it's a competition, but it is truly <laughs> a... A, 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 a transformational day to have this experience with you. Um, so again, thank you for reaching out to us. Our opening question, I wish I had a seatbelt on for this one, but Greg, tell us who you are and what do you do? Well, that's complex only in that when people that know me look at my life, they say, wow, everything just falls from the sky onto you. It's kind of amazing. And I say, well, I feel amazingly grateful that that's exactly what happens. It seems like everything that could happen to give me the full celebration of life, the full experience is happening and it's happening all the time. It started early and often and it's still going. And so I guess you would have to say I'm a serial entrepreneur by classification and I'm a believer of capitalism and the great American dream and the freedom that's afforded by creating economies of scale, creating wealth, creating a world where more people have more things to do because the world is that rich and it it needs to be fully explored and celebrated in every moment. And at a time when things are very negative, I've always used the downturns to create opportunity that are easier to see, are more visible because less people Mm -hmm. are doing things competing for space. It's important to understand that the experience I've had in 13 near death experiences has shaped dramatically who I am and what I do. And that is that I believe through the relationship I have with the world and with others, people will become better versions of whatever it is that they're supposed to do to create a better experience in life. And they'll do it in spite of themselves. That's kind of the running joke of what I received in the formula four is it transforms people in real time without them having any particular predisposition to that. So for example, in meditation, a lot of people say that's important to health, it's important to life, but how to meditate is an interesting question. I received four meditations in the Formula 4 on my 12th near-death experience that today manifest as uh, the one called instant happiness. It 
Mm -hmm. puts the left and right brain in total balance with dopamine. It balances dopamine and balances the right and left brain. So it gives people a lot of happiness and a lot of energy in six minutes. And people that watch it simply say that there's no learning curve. You simply watch and listen. And then there's one that is creating balance of voice or a clear voice uh, called total clarity meditation. And that combines what we call the head heart in formula four or the 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 logic of the man head with the woman heart. The man might say, you're not listening to logic or you're not understanding the basics of what I'm explaining. And a woman might say, but you're not listening to my feelings. And a man might say, but I don't know how to mm-hmm. listen to feelings, right? And when you have a mind and a heart that's in unity, it produces a clear voice in the middle. The voice then is clearly reflecting the idea that the head is saying, that looks really good to me. And the heart is saying, I love that I could do that because I can see it being done versus saying, I think that uh, that is very cool, but I don't feel like I could successfully do it. That's when the two aren't in sync and life goes up and down because the voice can't reflect agreement between the thoughts and the feelings or the, the mind and the emotions. And they both give off 25 watts of continuous power and receive it back from the universe as pure energy waveforms. But it's this that constructs all that in the ideas and words and pictures and thoughts into roadmaps, but in itself doesn't do any manifestation. It's just the most beautiful computer ever designed, but it doesn't do anything more than at the subconscious level, say, move over there, fire a neuron, walk, use a muscle, and then construct all Mm -hmm. kinds of visions and pictures. And plans. It's the heart pouring what it wants, likes, and loves that causes manifestation, rapid manifestation of the positive. And it's when a person sees that as what they don't want, don't like, and don't love that it causes rapid manifestation of the negative form of it. So that's sort of my view. What I do with all that is I build programs which are designed to build a better world so that we still have a world that'll be here to future generations. And when they inherit it, it'll be worth something meaningful to them and they'll be able to do great things with it. The notion that you have to struggle and that forms greatness is not a universal truth. The notion is that life is the most miraculous form of known technology in the universe. And that ecosystem that we have when honored in the optimal way creates what I received as the purpose of life, which is to create positive increase in all things good. But in the universe, we learn that every force, action, event, and situation has an equal and opposite one, but a middle two, a positive and a negative with a neutral position or a proton and an electron with a neutron. And what this... Mm -hmm that I've been able to achieve through my near-death experiences and in my business career and translate into economic form is the understanding that the movement of wealth creation, wealth being all things that are good and positive, your health is a form of wealth, your happiness is a form of wealth, your ability Mm -hmm. to celebrate life is a form of wealth, but it translates through the material, physical, and spiritual world in that way. So everything that I do, I guess could be encapsulated. I was recently giving an update on some business ventures of mine, uh, creating uh, over a billion dollars of commerce in the course of 40 years as a serial entrepreneur, creating and bringing to market uh, timely technologies and ideas in a variety of health and sciences and uh, technology, and even in the food space, the agricultural space. And in doing so, I've always had a, not a philanthropic bent, but a bent to do something great with it that makes life better for people. And in this venture capital meeting I was recently at, the two profound things that came out of it was that first I was asked to look at a technology, which was the artificial electronic retina implant, a nanotech that I saw first in 2000 developed by a half a million dollars of money from the Ben Franklin Institute, a grant. And he had something that analyzed light and color successfully, but didn't have the nanotech to support it. So when the backer said to me, this guy, whatever his name was at the time, I don't remember, is a brilliant genius way ahead of his time. 
I said, well, that's my cue to run for the hills. Because although I had the money to invest in it, ahead of your time is not the time in technology. You have to be right on time. That was the first thing that was profound. I was asked mm -hmm. to sit in this meeting and review last year the updated version developed and funded by the founder of Qualcomm, the biggest chip maker in the world in mobile devices. And he knew of my background, so he asked if I would sit in and ask if this was ready for human trials. And it actually was, and I talked how I could help. But I was asked by one venture capitalist in the meeting, it seems like you're talking about a bunch of ventures you're involved in. But he said, is there any part of it that doesn't seem like it's a do-gooder kind of a program? And I thought for a minute, I said, no, actually, I don't have anything that's not a do-gooder kind of program. Everything I do has to do good and do well. It has to benefit the world in some meaningful way. And the economy is scale that can be created from something like that that is good and embraced by a lot of people that it's going to help should always be considered good. But I said, furthermore, when you ask who I am and what I do, which was your opening question on the show here, uh, I, I started by saying in that meeting that, well, I start by saying that I've done a lot of things, which you may or may not find interesting. And I might bore you with my experience. Maybe not. But, but what I can tell you about me, and it was the first time I'd ever said it, is that I can honestly say I have the best life of anybody on earth. That's my sincere belief, not being boastful, not trying to tell you you should do something that I do, but saying I'm willing to share the information mm -hmm. because of what I've received and because of the way I act it out or deliver it to the world. I feel like I, in comparison to everybody I've ever met, literally experience and enjoy the best life on earth in terms of health, happiness, wealth, prosperity, abundance, and purposeful celebration of everything I'm doing all the time, good, bad, or indifferent. So that was my explanation of it. And everybody said, I kind of want to touch you now. And I want to get some of that information. <laughs> Let's change numbers and get me that information afterwards. To which I said, of course, you know, that's what I do. I, I mean, I, so much so as whereas they physically be like, I got to put my, my index finger on your shoulder or something like that, where they just be like, they just want to feel your vibration for, for a couple of seconds. Well, I can appreciate that. So anyway, that's, that's my background in uh, how I got started. And it took me into a lot of areas to do a lot of things. And I never felt like I was leading the program. I felt like it was always being dropped on me. And everybody that knows me would say things like, oh, you have the best life. You have such, you know, such amazing things that you're doing and celebration. I always said, though, it all comes around celebrating being alive and the near death experiences. If you read the works of PMH Atwater, who wrote most of the books on children of the near death experience, and I was on a couple of shows with her. Uh, she says that when you have a near death experience, it rewires the brain and it creates dramatic sensitivity to your experience that wouldn't be there without it. So that's, you know, sort of where it's taken me. And I've always felt like I'm receiving whatever I'm supposed to do next. And I felt like the reason I'm sent here to do this is because I honor that to such a high level of intestinal fortitude and the willingness to receive information, know if it's good, and then bring it forward where it can benefit the people, if you will. So one of the things that, um, that sticks out to me is even just as far as when you had reached out to us in order to be on this program, um, what I would like to know for people who are interested in also making their way onto other programs and being able to be a part of other people's content creation is, uh, what exactly do you do to uh, decide where you want to be on shows? Do you have an, I, I think it's called Pitch Podcasts, um, where I imagine a lot of the responsibilities on them, they seek out who to who to contact, and I don't know, maybe you do some of the um, uh, some curating yourself. But just let us know how you, you you came to even be in touch with us. I don't actually seek to be on any show at all whatsoever, but I get a lot of show appearances apparently because Kylie, who works in our office, is of these same beliefs. She's had her own experiences and follows the Formula Four. And she believes that she will be reaching out all over the global web and interact with people under the right circumstances. And that'll lead to the people that I should actually be talking to. So while I don't mm -hmm. have any specific knowledge of how or why you were contacted, I do know that Kylie believes, uh, as we all do here, that the divine forces are essentially guiding us to whatever we're supposed to do next. And when she sees it, she'll know each time. So apparently in her networking of your networking, she found you as one of the people that she felt was important for me to be talking to, to 
create a larger expansion of the message that we have and essentially bringing the planet to a better place where it'll a still be here in the future and and create sustainable goodness for future generations that'll be looking for something beyond so that's how that came about mm-hmm. interestingly enough i couldn't tell you how anybody was reached or how we did it but i do know that every single show i do is not, some are the mainstream, but most are not the mainstream. Most are the emerging new stream Mm -hmm. of consciousness. Well, well, Kylie has my gratitude then. Um, And in a way, it still does answer the question in that for someone at the whose whose time is as uh, is as valuable as, as yours is how does how does one uh, navigate that and the answer is well someone who aligns with your views who, who recognizes what's important and knows how to cure on your behalf is is, is taken on that mantle and uh, that that that's delegation in its in in its finest form very true and I would definitely say to expand on that 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 she, that Kylie knows when she's looking that she's going to encounter the right people somehow. And when they're given to me, I always know that, as you say, my time may be valuable. Everybody says their time is valuable. Uh, Some might say I cheat because I don't sleep during the week. So Monday through Friday, I don't literally sleep. Uh, Owing to what I thought was a a back injury at 20 or 42 years ago, being thrown down a flight of stairs from behind, waking up from a coma a few days later, with a disintegr- all the discs in my low back disintegrating, it turns out that uh, I wasn't going to walk ever again and I wasn't going to be normal, but then I became normal years later, learned about health, became a, a very uh, substantial person in the health field uh, that had other information that people didn't have, but that helped people significantly to improve their health in real time. Went from very injured, very damaged, very uh, ill growing up to 38 or nine years with not a single day of illness or pain or suffering, when that kind of defies the odds of having 121 bone breaks, uh, ribs torn from cartilage, Mm -hmm. shattered fragmented bones in both feet, torn cartilage in both knees, torn ligament in both elbows, um, uh, seven shoulder separations, among other things, a lot of other illnesses, and being pain-free for the bulk of my life, and reverse aging, which defies the logic of not sleeping, I only after my back injury could sleep about a half an hour straight without waking up because of the pain I couldn't get in a comfortable spot for years. And that turned into three hours a night of sleeping, which coincidentally is four cycles of going from consciousness, alpha, beta, delta, theta, REM, dream state, and back to beta. Mm -hmm. And then back again, that cycle happening four times, three hours. So for 24 years, I did that. And then I started receiving a lot more projects and found that during Monday through Friday, I couldn't sleep because I didn't have time. Not that I wasn't tired. I became not tired after a short time. And I actually used the information I received on my 12th near death experience to reverse age. So, so according to latest science, my calendar age would be 63 in this coming June, but my biological age is closer to 38, according to the length of my chromosome ends on my telomeres. And that can be measured year over year with a DNA test. I was actually uh, increasing the length of my telomeres, which pre- previous was not known to happen in nature. They shrink as you get older, every time your cells replicate or repair. Mine were growing 8% a year, hence increasing my. Uh, longevity by decreasing my biological age and my hormonal age even further. So that is profound because in receiving that information and using that and spreading it to others, they've had the identical experience, literally transformation. So we, because we've uh, we, we've brought up the near death experiences a few times already. There's the question that I wanted to ask in regards to it, and one of the things I do try to do is just make sure that I'm trying to come from an angle that other people haven't come from. Granted, I haven't seen all the content that you've been on, but um, what I'm wondering about the uh, experiences is that towards I was I would say I guess the latter experiences, did you develop an ability to identify the information being sent in such a way that you are more attuned to that state? Um, so just to give you a little more flavor to it, so being in, in the state for the first time is probably the most uh, traumatic it, it can be. But then, well, I mean, you know, it's happened another uh, so many times. 
and not to say that it's become routine, but you, I think there's more of an att- uh, of an attenuation to it. So, what has uh, transpired over the course of these uh, experiences, where maybe you've been able to glean more information, you were more heightened, and more aware of that state? Uh, did you ever get like, oh, another one of these? Come on, guys, I got, I got to be somewhere. The first time it happened to me, uh, it went on for three straight days. It was after my twelfth near death experience, and. I actually, previous to that, was consciously aware of one thing growing up that I wanted to check out, that I really didn't think the planet was very good. I didn't think the people were very nice, Mm -hmm. and I thought they were very petty and that they got stuck really easily with words on minutia and and conflict, real easily, and and misjudging things and trying to use and manipulate words in such a way that it weaponized every situation. And so being keenly aware of that, I felt forced me into being bullied a lot, forced me into rising up and fighting back and taking on a lot of bullies and learning how to fight at a very high level and becoming the eradicator of bullies. Uh, But I was aware that my mind was always empty, like that of a person that describes a neutral state as practicing yoga like being a yoga, practicing yogi for 11 years, mm-hmm. apparently is supposed to achieve that state of neutrality or a blank state, if you will, which is this, the period under which supposedly stress is all alleviated. What I noticed that my, that was my state of mind all the time. Literally, the only thing that was going on in my mind was if somebody asked me something and that the answer would always stream in. The correct answer was always universal truth, and it would always stream in. And people always seem to be so profoundly shocked by my answers, but in a positive way, saying that it was literally transformative mm-hmm. to them. And so I was keenly aware of that, that it was having the same experience every time that I would receive information that I had to convey to others. It was always to convey to others or to apply to a situation to have the optimal great situation that works in the best way and has that epic proportions kind of, you know, outcome. So I was always keenly aware of that from a young age. But when I got that information, it went on for three days of this stream that was fairly overwhelming. And over the next several years, as I applied that information, I found that I always got amazing, perfect results to everything. The second principle I received was called the magic formula for everything. The first being the purpose of life, which was to create positive increase in all things good. But then when we see and receive that thing or that person that we want, like, and love, our understanding of it or our view of it only rises to a certain high level of positiveness, at which time we start to see its limitations. And then we cause it to break down, not knowing that it's our vision of its limitations or what's wrong with that thing or that person that we wanted, liked, and loved, that now certain things we don't want, don't like, and don't love, and we then send that message, and Mm -hmm. the universe is perfect to give it back to us in that equal form. I use a couple of examples that I received that I think are always profound to most people. One's about health, and one's about money. Uh, And the Formula 4 that I received, um, which has helped me in, for example, all my businesses, like Max D and something we can talk a little bit about if you like, but the successes that I've had have been profound in letting that information come in and guide me. And when it comes in, I'm profoundly aware of how perfect it is. And all I do is push it forward as if it was the required next thing to do. I don't feel like I'm uh, credited for any of the things I've accomplished as having come up with those ideas. I feel that just by remaining calm and receiving those informations and then pushing them out, they're always successful as if to be the magic formula of that thing. So I've been able to apply this in business to a very high level, meaning in the current uh, business I'm in, well, in the last business I was in was an agricultural product, and it was known as Z-Trim, and it was developed at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it took corn hulls, the lowest common denominator in grain milling, corn, you know, the part that sticks in your teeth when you're eating popcorn at a movie. Yep. And it turned it into zero calorie fat replacement. So it was the the lowest economic piece to be sold to either feedlot or cattle food for filler in, in feed to animals being bred. And uh, it was now going to be used according to their most famous scientist in history by shearing it in a centrifuge. It cost a half a million dollars. 
and will blow little tiny holes through this plastic-like shell substance so that it can hold 98% water and mimic fat. Fat being nine calories a gram, the most caloric ingredient in food, but what carries the nutrients and makes food taste good. Take out fat, you lose both of those characteristics and you make the food unhealthy. By taking this ingredient and putting it through this centrifuge, it would hold 98% water and be able to manipulate or, or simulate uh, foods that would require some of this instead of oils or dairy fats or other kinds of saturated or unsaturated fats. And it had zero calories, but it had the exact properties of those fats. So it was truly a miracle breakthrough. Now, when I received the technology, which I paid at that time about in 2002, $4 million in, in stock that was not liquid at the time to a, a technology transfer company, went and met the inventor. And he said that he, he gave me this little bag of about an ounce of the material and said, it took me a year to make this in that centrifuge in his lab. And then he showed what it's like in food. And it was remarkable. But he said, I will caution you that Unilever and ConAg are the two biggest food companies. The second and third biggest food company, I believe, at that time, were had spent $5 million trying to commercialize it. And their, their conclusion was it couldn't be commercialized. There's no way to manufacture this large scale or build any kind of process that will take it from a lab to mass production. Mm -hmm. And even if it could be, nobody in the industry it could be too expensive. And even if it wasn't too expensive, nobody would want it because they have better solutions like fat and gums and other things made in food. Now, with that in mind, two years in and a million dollars of cash, I found that I was further behind than those guys. So I wondered, you know, am I sane? Is there a reason I'm doing this? And talking to the universe and saying, you know, if you want something else out of this, I'm going to need to know pretty quick because I'm wasting a lot of time and money on something that can't seem to work. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what to do with this. And I've spent a million dollars. And one guy who was sure he could make it at a Primera, a company that did turned eggs into powdered egg products for reuse in other foods, uh, said that he could make the product. And $100,000 later, he had taken four tons of this material, literally four tons off scraps of corn milling production, and turned it into this much product. Mm -hmm four tons. He could make this much product out of it, the same as the guy in the lab, except this product that he made had a smell like a burnt rubber whoopee cushion, like the novelty you stick under somebody when they sit down to make them sound like they farted. Well, that that's what it smelled like. I actually deal with that smell as like, by the way. Oh, there you go. So I had that product and, and it, it, the product that originally was given had no smell. So that's what he was able to make with $100,000. Now with that wish to the universe, hey, is there a real reason I got this or am I being set up for a practical joke by the universe? And a minute later, I got a phone mm -hmm. call over the loudspeaker at my 44,000 square foot office where I was incubating new technologies in Chicago. And the fellow gets on the phone and he says, hello, this is Dr. Deveni Shukla. And he said, uh, I want to come and make Zetrim with you. And I said, well, okay, great. But, you know, what are you and why would you be able to do this? Because I've been all over the world and nobody's been able to figure this out, not even the biggest food companies. And he said, well, he was leaving a company called ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, a big grain company in, uh, in Illinois. And he said that uh, he was leaving because he got tired of the one of the key officers taking him in a private jet and talking about who he needed to kill. <laughs> and that was proven <laughs> later in a movie with Matt Damon. OK, a true story. And, um, but he said, my life has brought me to be the, possibly the only person that would understand what the inventor was doing and how it translated into a mass production. And so I said, well, look, uh, he says it was Treveni Shukla PhD for, which he st said stood for piled high and deep. And he was a very funny character. And I said, well, when can you come and visit me? I want to talk about this because I've about given up on this. And he said, well, uh, about an hour I can drive from Wisconsin to Illinois because my wife loves to shop at the nearby mall. So he came by and he told me, yes, absolutely, I can make this. No one else in the world will figure this out, what I already know and how to do this. And I said, well, if you can do it, what would you want? And he gave me an $8,000 a month salary and some stock in the company because he said that's going to be worth a lot. So I gave him both that and said, when can you start? He said, on Monday. That was a Friday. 
uh, he started the following Monday and in 30 days, the approximate date he gave me within 30 days, we'll have our first production. He went to a pilot plant and made 46 pounds of it at a cost of about $10 a pound, which was a miracle because I really spent a lot of time on it and, and nobody had any hope for this thing at all. And uh, a year and a half later, the stock was a three cent stock that went to almost $9 on high volume. Uh, it created a huge fanfare when we announced that the biggest food company in the world, Nestle, would give us a contract to make the product. And and the whole idea of this that I'm setting up for you here is that all I did was just call to the universe and put my faith that I would receive whatever I'm supposed to receive to do the next thing and be a good earth soldier, be a good living being on earth, bringing good things, good solutions to the world that desperately needs these solutions. And years later, uh, I would go on to a bunch of other things and I would go off and take a two year RV trip with my girls who I was producing their music band at the time. And they met with some great success. And then I settled in California, which was my lifelong dream. And then I took a couple of years off. Then in 2009, I had a ruptured appendix and I went to the hospital after three days sitting at home with it and said, I need you to catheter me because I can't pee. And, you know, for a guy to sit there for five hours not being able to pee is driving me nuts. So they said, well, it's kind of crowded yeah. here in the emergency. Wait till we get you at least a curtain. And I said, I can't wait for that, you know. And so they cathetered me and people were walking by and looking, well, that's strange. And I said, I don't care. I peed a gallon in five minutes. I said, now take out my appendix. And they said, well... <laughs> Why do you say that? I said, because it's been ruptured. <laughs> Manual rolfing, about deep tissue body work done at home by a rolfer three days ago that I was sleeping through the rolfing. And while it's a long story, most people don't make it a day through rolfing. And they sure don't sleep through it because it's very painful. They dig deep in the body and stretch the muscle and the fascia away from the bone to re-elongate the spine, the effects of gravity and injuries that I had certainly profoundly had. And, uh, I said, but the, the person manually ruptured my appendix and I've always had a premonition about my appendix and I was sleeping through the rolfing. And when I woke up, I thought I had food poisoning, not knowing it was a ruptured appendix. They had manually ruptured my appendix. And now for three days, I was sitting at home with it. And they said, you couldn't go more than an hour with a ruptured appendix. People come in here after an hour, they're crying for pain meds. They can't, they can't stand the pain. And um, mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm in a different class because I've had so many injuries and I said, I've gone through so many phases that I'm at level 16 of pain management. And they said, level 16, there's only five known levels. <laughs> What's 16 levels? I said, well, the 16th level without getting all into that, since I need my appendix taken out now, is that's the part where you experience the pain in its full glory, but it's not interesting to you anymore because you're apathetic to it. And so you can just turn it on and off like a switch. And that's what the 16th level of pain is. And so they said, okay, well, we don't think so, but we'll take the test. And we, I had to drink the iron liquid and then they took an x-ray and they said, okay, it is ruptured. There's no doubt about that, but we don't think it's a big rupture. Maybe recently, maybe a half hour cleanup of peritonitis and so forth. And it was a six hour cleanup because it was a mess. And when I came to uh, the, at the foot of the bed were the, the anesthesiologist and the, and the surgeon, they were like, I'm like, hey, you guys are the best, man. Can I press this button and get some more euphoria? And I was doing that and really having a good time. You know, being a product of the 60s and 70s drug culture, I was like, man, I can sit here all day with this button. You guys are the best. <laughs> and, and they had a laugh and they said, okay, well, we have a bet. And that's why we're here. I wait for you to wake up. We have a bet. And I said, yeah, what's that? And they said, what's, what, was, what was all that black stuff inside you that we had to clean out? And I said, six, 86 pills of activated charcoal. And they said, well, you saved your own life. And I said, well, I know that, but you know, what's the point here? I need more meds here, buddy. <laughs> and uh, so they put me in for recovery. They said, you're going to have a long recovery. And on the third day of recovery, I said, who uh, somebody was with, can you go see who that woman, I think her name was Kathy, was putting meds in my bag. And they said, I didn't see anybody. And I said, well, please go find out who that was because they had medium blonde hair and they were dead. They couldn't just smell them. They were absolutely dead. No, I couldn't. I don't know what you're talking about. They went around looking for an hour and couldn't find anybody. I said, well, when you go put the, this gurney by the door and put this curtain because they're going to come in later, I believe, when I'm sleeping and medicate me until I die. <laughs> I don't know why I knew that, but that's what I said. Uh, well, at 4.16 a.m., I woke up and I was trying to call out, but 
that nothing would come out because I was so over medicated that I was way beyond euphoria. And I see them put meds in the bag. And that goes on for from 416, according to the clock, till 421, at which time I went in and uh, uh, flatlined and saw the end of the world. For what I thought was four hours, it was clear that I was in the end of the world, walking through the end of the destruction, and it was 2023. There was no doubt about those things. And that I then later, when I was done surviving that experience, I then, because my, my 13th near death experience wasn't really a death experience. It was an end of the world experience of death. <laughs> okay. All death, mm-hmm. just being dead in the dead. And it made horror films that I had been familiar with as a younger person seem kind of like kindergarten show and tell, you know, like really something of real great pleasant nature, not uh, that, you know, that Scorpio macabre thing that would be very dark, you know, it would be, um, uh, you know, clear to me that something else was going on. And then later I started getting uh, something that had happened to me quite a bit before, but was now happening more often. People would say, I had a dream last night. And I said, was I in it? And they said, yes. And I said, well, then I'm familiar with the dream. Was I standing around you and you were on a table and I was doing something with some, you know, device, but I wasn't touching you? Yes. Were there other people around me that you didn't recognize that look like they could be from alien cultures? Yes. And do you feel like whatever terminal disease you had uh, that you were suffering from is now gone, like it never occurred? And they said, yes. And I said, well, maybe you should go get that tested. In every case, they would go get it tested. And whatever it was, was not only gone, but the Doctors involved were saying, you know, those things don't go away. I mean, there's no known incidence of terminal illnesses like stage four cancers that have been given up on and all these other things could just go away. Um, We must have made a mistake in our diagnosis. We must have mixed up your records or something. Every time it was that. And so then I got all these Pleiadian visits in my dream state and my conscious state that says, okay, enough fooling around now. You've been given every success there can be. You've been basically handed Mm -hmm. on a platter a life that's otherworldly and that is what you claim is the alternate universe that you supposedly live in. You've been granted that. So that's your experience. And you've been given all the, all the things that go with that in the physical material and spiritual world. Yes. Yes. And so it's time now to take that information you got on the previous near death experience, which you needed the other 11 to level your brain out. So it could actually receive it without you turning it into the Greg brand of super help or beneficial mindfulness or some other nonsense that we've been trying to do is to get 3000 pieces of information through that channel to you. So you could have this amazing uh, experience, live the life you wanted, and then take that information and push it out to the world before it destroys itself. Because in every cultural evolution in known history of the universe, when people get to the technology phase, they always get their worst ideas and destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. And you have one chance here to use the intestinal fortitude that you come from with your Pleiadian background to to deliver that material and get people to level up and be able to go past the technology stage into that utopic uh, vision, the end of violence, the beginning of utopia. So that 2023 is either going to be the end of all things or the beginning of that new better world that people are going to have amazing experiences because that other stuff's been worked out. And in evolutionary cultures where they don't have this problem, they've had to survive that phase. And it's only when the planets align the correct way and the right steps are taken by the right people at the right time, the perfect magic formula for that event that people get past this without destroying themselves with bad ideas. So that's your mission now, and now enough fooling around. You've been given all this information. You were given 11 near-death experiences uh, that you were even reckless about. You got to a point where you were like, ah, nothing I do, I'm going to die, so I might as well do it anyway. And you know, and, and, and you were made to survive that. But your brain was rewired, as you know, uh, to a level where you could receive whatever we could give you at that point, a three-day transmission that is the mother load of this information, and you could receive it and know that it wasn't yours and knowing it belongs to the people. So their survival depends on it and you can deliver it to them and, and, and preserve the future of this planet. So it doesn't pre- create all types of toxic uh, uh, byproducts from its events that it's doing uh, and, and harm the rest of the universe since we're all in a collective consciousness. So that with that information, armed with that information, I began to actually really fill my purpose up 
with those kinds of things, began to speak, talk, and live on a full-time basis that, that truth that I believe. And as I've said, a couple things about it that I think are kind of funny. I think Pleiadians are naturally, on my, on my first near-death experience, I was five and I had a tonsillectomy. I hemorrhaged and I had to be taken to the hospital to cauterize where they suffocate you with a sponge, like a loofah filled with iodine, and they shove it down with a, a like a tongs, like you flip a burger on a grill. And in that moment, mm-hmm. about 25 to 30 seconds, you suffocate. And it's a near-death experience. I literally went in a tunnel and was told, go back. You don't belong in here. Don't be looking around in here. And that kept happening to me for a long time in these very extreme uh, uh, near-death experiences of car accidents, drownings, uh, shot at and slashed in one night, uh, thrown down a flight of stairs, put in a coma, uh, drug overdose, um, the, the, the inhaling and in the pinochorian gas. But they said that that way I was fully prepared for being able to receive it and having such a level of openness that I literally wouldn't stand in the way of that experience. I would just let it come through and then deliver it in its exact form. So, for example, in Formula 4, when you see what is in the first release, um, uh, uh, 16 hours of content, that's two sessions of my just my part of 16 hours of content. The, the principles are redone with high definition video and subtitles and different voices to create non-boring events with cool background music and all created in my studios. But the supportive material explaining what each thing is and how it works and what to do with it is me talking for 16 hours in two sessions of eight hours with each being one 10 or 15 minute break between the two four hour sessions. And those sessions are not scripted. They're streamed in. It's me talking continuously like I'm doing now. I have literally done 500 hours of content since then, and not one is rehearsed, not one has a script, not one has a prompt, not one has a redo, not one has an um or an ah or a big pause. It's just me continuously streaming that content through and delivering it exactly as I receive it. So I think all the training was clearly told to me was made so that I could get the information in its exact form and deliver it as perfect universal truth to the, to the masses of earth. And that each person would be able to get a level up to take their part on the world stage, whether or not they wanted a cushy life where they don't decide anything wasn't really important. It was the awakening of what you're made of and how you can do a good job at whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I received. And that's what I unknowingly all those years had been applying in business. I always knew that business seems to be very easy for me. Whatever I want to do seems to work very well with no learning curve and no uh, specific challenges along the way. But I asked one of my protégés once who lived with me for five years, he came from a yogi background. And he said something very interesting. Uh, He said that it takes 11 years of four hours a day to master living in the now or being present in every moment for a yogi. And he said it's very interesting when he was in being my protege, living with me for five years, and the yogis came to visit him. He was later able to say this is how he learned that principle in an hour that they said could not be learned in more than, in less than 11 years of four hours a day. He learned in an hour and had it mastered mm-hmm. in a week. Living in the now, being present at every moment is a principle I received called lifetime zone management. And it teaches exactly the state of being that you would experience if you were there to such a high level of easy to understand that you would say, well, I already know that's true. In my heart, I know that's perfect, correct information. I don't know how I know, mm-hmm. but I just know. Or I can apply it immediately now. And, and the running joke is this stuff works in spite of you. Okay. So <laughs> no matter your background, it works to create the result that we're talking about. And it works with by simply watching, listening, and if necessary, applying a simple exercise in real time and getting the exact result you want. There's no learning curve which is why somebody might say, I'm like the kid that went to school that was given all the answers to the test. You should be given all the answers that are perfect universal truths, not given any questions in school, because why give a question 
the answer will answer lots of questions, but the question won't necessarily provide a truthful or correct universally true answer. So I received it and I didn't know all these years I was able to apply it in every circumstance. And I asked my protege, I said, you've seen me in my lifestyle, what I do and what I manage. I said, how long would it take you before you would stress out if you were doing what I do every day? That seems to me like a perfect, amazing life. He said, well, the maximum would be two days at which time I'd have to kill myself, Mm -hmm. which I found amazing, you know, but that was an opening, an eye opening for me that my great life was the way I'm able to celebrate my moments and live in that now. I was looking, I had him look online for all 3000 principles to find similarities for things that were being uh, preached or taught in the world in self-help or mindfulness or life coaching or a million other things. And he wasn't able to find anything similar. And as other experts have said, that uh, there isn't anything quite like it. It's actually the opposite of all the known truths. And the information is very valuable. And it comes at a time when the world really needs this information because it's transformational. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just the most fascinating part about because I would go into a business deal and encounter massive problems that seem so easy. I'm like, don't you see you just do this and then you just do that? And everybody like, no, I don't see that. And then we do it and they go, that was brilliant. I said, not brilliant at all. They say, you're so smart. I said, not even remotely intelligent. There's nothing going on in here. If I'm intelligent, it's understanding that the overactive mind is causing a problem. Yeah. And I don't have anything in my mind. And so we looked online and he found one thing that was similar to this information. Well, the similar as you want to get. Deepak Chopra, who everybody knows who that is, right, in a spiritual sense, he has the beautiful Indian accent, and he seems to say things that have uh, an element of spiritual truth or universal metaphysical truth. And he was asked in one of his episodes uh, by his follower, a woman that said, I want to be able to live more in the present moment. I want to live in the now. I want to be present in every moment. Can you advise me how to do that? And his answer was this. Well, I'm not sure that you can actually do that. I I think it's a talent, an ability you're either born with or you're not. Mm -hmm. But he said, going beyond that, for example, you don't even know why your brain thinks of the word rhinoceros before you say it. Now, she was genuinely confused after that, and rightly so. I believe his point might have been that we're such a low level of consciousness without saying that, that, you know, there's a long ways to go. But I'm pleased to say that the principles I received answer all those questions in real time and create positive manifestation of everything from spontaneous healing of terminal illnesses, which the material in the meditations, rapid healing and incredible health, have actually shown to have a scientific validity to terminally ill people that got miraculously better in short periods of time. Mm -hmm. And even the reverse aging that I did, it defies science to say that I did it while sleeping less and less and less. There's a a man at Harvard that got a book deal, I think Doubleday or Harcourt, when he said he was going to use his background in psychology and and, and physiological science to uh, prove that we don't really need sleep. And for five years, he was to stay up pretty much most of the time, proving the dispute between Freud and Carl Jung that uh, we only sleep, not for a known physical reason, but maybe to regain a connection with our original spiritual consciousness. What's most interesting about that experiment is that after he signed the deal and went on his what was going to be the reporting of his experience and the publishing of his book, after a year and a half, he went from 45 to the doctor. At 45 years old, he had had a checkup beforehand. And the doctor now advised him that in that year and a half, he has prematurely aged to age 72 or so. And that if he didn't stop it, he'd be dead before a year was up. So the, 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 there's a defiance of the known value of sleep. I, on the hand, have, as I become more engaged and more enthusiastic, use uh, one of the programs that teaches sleep and teaches energy maximize energy and optimize sleep and optimize sleep. I find that I come to find that most people don't sleep very well. And I found out this by asking the questions that came to me in this information, how long does it take you to fall asleep? And a lot of people said things like, 
I fall asleep really fast. It takes me not more than five or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's fast. I said, I haven't fallen asleep in longer than 10 seconds in 13 years. Now, how do you do that? Well, I was given the techniques to do that. And everybody that's learned it in this information has, has done exactly that and leveled up their health amazingly. Because when you have a great sleep and you fall within the cycle, for example, if you sleep eight hours, you're waking up in the middle of a dream cycle. So you could sleep really restfully and wake up feeling exhausted or lose your energy in the middle of the day. Yeah. This teaches how those dream cycles work. It teaches how to. Sorry, I was just going to say like that's some of the, some weird things been happening to me the last couple of weeks where I would like notice I'm looking over at the alarm clock and it's 444 AM. I'm like, well, this isn't 8 AM. I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to sleep. And it would take me about 30 minutes to, to fall asleep. And I've had to devise a whole routine to do it where I would lay flat on my back and, uh, and, and hold on to a pillow. Um, what I found was like laying flat on my back was helping my body start to produce the melatonin and to get, try to get as much cortisol out of the system. Cause it was the most clear way that I can communicate to my body. I'm trying to fall asleep right now. Uh, so to hear that you can do it in less than 10 seconds, uh, there, I don't know. I actually know one other person who can fall asleep pretty quickly. Like he'll have a cup of coffee and then he'll just, well, it won't matter. Like the coffee will have no effect on him whatsoever. And then he just falls asleep. So, um, I don't know. It, it's, it, it could be a, a talent in of itself, but it sounds like there's more to it than that, that there really are um, some, some, some life changes that we can make throughout the day as well that will help manifest better sleep. Well, actually, the daily changes are made in what we call maximized energy program. That's the second program of the second set, which is the Epic Accelerator set. And there we talk about that all health and the health that I enjoy, essentially having grown up very injured, very ill, very sick. And now spending the last two thirds of my life with no sickness, no illness and no pain for massive injury, being able to compete in any sport I want at the highest possible level. Uh, for example, recently took up ping pong because I had a group of future Olympians that wanted me to train them in the sports psychology of the game. And since I've used that in my own martial arts competition and use it to train professional sports teams, uh, like back in Chicago, I trained the Chicago Bears, took them from a losing season of six and 10 to a winning season of 11 and five and one simple turnaround. Uh, working for Mike Ditko was a really tough guy that doesn't like to lose. Uh, that I learned that the, mm -hmm. the cornerstone of health, uh, the, 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 the two bookends are sleep, however it's done, the, it's done a certain way, and energy. And energy healing is a, a very Pleiadian model. It says that when you get sick, the first thing that happens is you lose your energy. You run down. You have to lay down. Your energy becomes exhaustion, and that becomes a recovery from illness. And the first thing to come back is the same thing that's the first to leave, energy. So you start to feel like you got a little more energy. You can get up and move around. When you preserve a large energy reserve, you literally will learn over time with this information to almost never be tired at all. I can't remember the last time I was tired, but I've gone from three hours of sleep a night for 24 years to in the last four years, down to almost no sleep ever during the week, uh, up to maybe a couple hours, just randomly sitting up in these Herman Miller chairs that are ergonomic and you can sleep sitting up without getting a sore muscle or anything, to uh, nine hours on the week and a six hour and a three hour increment. Uh, a, a total of not more than 11 or 12 hours of sleep in a week is very unusual by any standard. Uh, and then the, the, the converse of that is how well you sleep when you sleep. So I love sleep. I have the a greatest mattress. I have the greatest pillows. I have them arranged a special way. I have uh, climate controlled sheets and everything in my sleep environment is perfect. And I love to sleep, but I love to do all the things I'm engaged in. And I only sleep when I need to sleep, when I require it, which is very, very rare. Okay. So sleep and energy are really two important parts, but they're bookends or they're the flip side of it, each other. Uh, when you sleep, you should have an amazing sleep because if you don't have an amazing sleep, you're not optimizing your health in the sleep state. So however much you sleep, it should always be through the cycle from the beginning to end of the cycle. So alpha, beta, delta, theta, REM, and all the way back to beta, then back down again. That cycle takes usually 45 minutes. So in three hours, you'd have four cycles. In six hours, you'd have eight cycles. In, 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 and you'd have 10 if you went seven and a half. 
But if you went to eight hours, you'd wake up in the middle of another dream cycle and it would essentially destroy most. It wouldn't hurt body rest or tissue repair, but it would hurt the psychological, emotional benefit of waking up in the middle of a dream cycle being very disruptive to whatever was going on that was then unresolved, even if you wouldn't remember it. Mm -hmm. And I teach people in that work through what I received to stop dreaming as well, because dreaming is a disruption that generally connotates a negative experience more than a positive experience. And plus, it's not tangible that all the dream analysis in the world doesn't create tangible support for your experience in the real world. And so it becomes a lot of occult guesswork. And occult guesswork is always challenging for most people that engage in it because they become very excited about it, but then everything becomes a symbol for the things they're creating, positive or negative, most of which are taught in the negative or the dark side. And occult really isn't representative of that. It's the same as everything else. It has an equal and opposite positive and negative charge, but it's seen more as mysterious. So it's often misunderstood like a dark place. Yeah. So, so the key there is that in that uh, uh, sleep state, if you have an optimal effect, then you end up with a very restful state. And when you wake up, you're actually energized because you've completed that whole emotional process. Okay. And it doesn't leave anything there to do. The falling asleep during sleep is very important because to the extent it takes longer than 10 seconds, there's a high degree of likelihood that up to Anything after 30 seconds to five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes is the process of the brain downloading and recycling all of the events that the person experiences in their life or during the day that are distressful. They're there because they haven't been resolved. So the person is is interacting with them and that isn't Mm -hmm. sleeping and it's not good sleeping. It's the interference with sleep with all these unresolved things that have no chance of resolution in that time zone but only have the chance to go into the sleep state and create other kinds of problems that the person then has to wake up with and carry forth again. So that's a, uh, a repeated cycle. Also, you're taught the best positionings to have in the sleep state to, op- you know, to optimize and where to put the pillows to keep you from moving. So there's a lot of things going on in that sleep state. Uh, the optimized sleep program is really going to help people uh, with having an amazing experience. Now I have that amazing experience and going to sleep in a controlled five or 10 seconds. For me, it's mostly like two seconds. Okay. Um, literally I hit the pillow and it's like a hypnosis cue. You're now out. Okay. But to learn that is a very simple exercise that's taught in the work, uh, how to actually create that. It's a simple visualization, uh, exercise. And it, it takes about a month to develop, but once it's mastered, most people find that in the first, the first week of doing it, about a few minutes a day, that they get within uh, that week the ability to fall asleep in about a minute or two from whatever they were doing before, five minutes, 10 minutes. And the other thing I would say is that mm-hmm. if you wake up like you did uh, and you're not falling asleep, then you may also not be really tired. You may be oversleeping, but by all means, if even if you feel like you're restful, get up and do something like reading or watching a show, anything that would typically bore you back to sleep is what you do next. And if that's not working after a very short time it, it, to create no negative scenarios in your sleep state, it's better to get up and do other things until the tiredness returns and be prepared that maybe you won't sleep anymore that day. It's not, it's not going to hurt you if you're falling within the other parameters of that program. In the energy state, we show you how to build an energy reserve. And that information is very valuable because in all the times when you were working through tiredness, you didn't have optimal energy reserve. And in the Pleiadian sense, all health is based on the energy reserve. The bigger it is, the more it can be relied on in times of stress, stress being depleted quicker uh, 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 the source of energy in those moments. So those are very valuable uh, in that in that realm. Uh, and, and it's gotten me through a million circumstances where I say that I'm not stressed out and other people say I would be dying in that circumstance. So I give these two examples that I was alluding to before of conveying the wrong message and getting back the wrong result. Uh, one example would be, and the words really matter. Uh, 
in, in, the, in the program Positive Manifestation, we learned that to manifest, we all do manifest, everything we have is manifested. But whether it's manifested very quickly or takes years is the real question. I manifest in real time. This information will give people the, this special extra skill of being able to manifest in real time by understanding that once you have thought of this positive, affirmative thing that you really want, like, and love, and sent love on it from the heart, you have a clear thought, you send this love from the heart, you then speak in this positive way that unifies thoughts and feelings onto the same page, reflected by the words, then you believe in the positive affirmative. Oftentimes you're believing in something that hasn't happened yet, but you have to believe in it as if it's happened. Mm -hmm. That's the what. There's a principle called focus a clear what. That means don't focus on the how something will happen. Focus on the what you want, pour love on it, and the universe will take care of the how part. That's a fundamental law of the universe. The more you try to orchestrate the how, the more you'll interfere with the result and create the wrong result or a negative result or a delay of a result that you really want. So that's very important. And then the last part is to receive the positive affirmative that we learn in that program as well. Receiving is the part that you would think would be the easy part. It's mostly the hardest part. Most people haven't decided when they do all this great work that they think is so good, what it is they're supposed to actually receive or whether or not they're worth anything. And because of that, they the universe doesn't know what to send, so it sends mixed things, which is a confirmation that it hasn't mm -hmm. really worked. Now, the two examples that it comes right to is one for health and one for wealth. The health one is the person that says something like, I take really good care of myself, so I don't understand why I have this health problem. Now, there's three messages. I have a health problem. I don't understand why I have it. And I take really good care of myself. Most people would think one is negative, one is neutral, and one is positive. Okay. But what they're really getting is three that are completely negative. And they make it even, they even make the situation worse. So people don't even understand the laws of communication to the universe or how important the literal words they say are in getting the words right. Mm -hmm. So, so in that example, I said, I have a health problem. So I, I already identify I have a health problem. So that means I have a certain level of acceptance of a health problem. I am the health problem. That's my identity. If I've had it longer than a year, it's a chronic problem, not an acute problem. So it becomes my physiology. My physiology will master a health problem or a disease or an illness the same way it'll master good health. But mostly people don't have any good message of health. Hence, we have a principle called great health living. And, and that's where you identify a po the most positive, optimized health message of your internal brilliant ecosystem that you can do. And so they've said, I have a health problem. That's negative. Then they've said, I don't understand why I have a health problem because I take really good care of myself. That would seem neutral, but it's not. It's highly negative that I don't understand why I have a health problem. If you ever find somebody that doesn't understand why they have a health problem, they're the ones that are going to test after test after test, and they can never figure out what's wrong with this person, or they have an idea, but they can never resolve it. Because the person has said that my health problem that I accept that I have is a mystery. Mm -hmm. And the universe says, okay, we'll keep making a mystery so you can keep trying to solve it. It doesn't know there's another message that's supposed to be, I have perfect health because you haven't given that message. And the third part is the part that everybody would say is the positive. I take really good care of myself. That's actually the worst part, harming you the worst. The fact that you take really good care of yourself only proves that you have a health problem you identify with that you don't understand how you got it or what the cause of it is. And the confirmation of it is I take really good care of myself, which shows that almost nothing I do is going to work. Because I take good care of myself, but it leads to a health problem I don't understand. <laughs> so that's the example I would give you for health. And the example I would give you for wealth is the person that says, I need money. And if anybody says, I need money, I would say, don't ever say that. That's living in abject poverty. If you need money, the universe will keep setting you up to try to overcome money for this bill, money for this situation difficulty over here, needing money for that situation, because your message to the universe is not that money comes naturally to you, that you love money, which is what a person that's wealthy tends to love money. They love deals. Mm -hmm. They love money. They love anything that gives them a lot of money. 
They may be good in life beyond that, in which they do good or bad, but those things are not mutually exclusive. I need money means the universe will keep putting you in difficult situations so you can keep having to need money. It doesn't know that you want a lot of money. If you said, would you like a million dollars? Of course, I'd like a million dollars. But, you know, what are you going to do with that? Well, I don't know, but I need a million dollars. I want a million dollars. I'd love a million dollars. But first, you have to love and embrace money. There can't be any blockage. You also have to let money flow through you. So you have to be willing to collect it and aggregate it because you love it. And you have to know that you're going to do good things with it also. So you can still be the good person that you already are. So that, that's a more simplistic version. But again, your message will go to the universe. And since the universe doesn't know you, it only knows your message. And if you give a positive message to the universe that's consistently positive, you will get a consistently positive result back if you expect a consecutively consistently positive result. If you don't expect a positive result, if you don't associate money with freedom and value and love and goodness and a better life for yourself and your loved ones and your friends and family and maybe the the whole world in the future if you take it to that level then you will not get that so to to be successful in wealth creation you have to envision all the good that it does for you and all the love that you will have for that good and all of the good you can do in your life in your world for others as well so those are messagings that's very important that are learned very profoundly in this work. And people will say to me, what about if I say this? And I say, well, that's completely negative. And it, 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 there's a real learning curve in learning the Pleiadian language is what's called the positive affirmative. A principle calls what is this or what it, it always looks at everything in the room like a philosopher, not a psychologist. What do you think? What do you think? What's that look like? What are they saying over there? And takes that whole consensus and then receives the best way to deal with all that. It's, it's, a, it's an exercise that creates a development. Well, one thing that I want to convey to our listeners uh, taking this information in is one of the through lines that I wanted people to understand about um, e-commerce and, uh, and through this show is that with all of the people who say they they earn their capital by way of uh, of drop shipping and they tend to move on to other things and in order to really be ready for that um uh, for that level of success and to as you say level up is to recognize that what you're doing is you're fulfilling a much more important purpose in the world you know people the reason why people have a lot of money is because also they have a lot of influence and they have a lot of uh, of responsibility and 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 that's what I think what where a lot of people end up just deciding not to, not to bother with it is because they don't want to or they don't see themselves as an elevated person. Um, and that's just something that we have to accept. If we're going to elevate ourselves, if we're going to take on this wealth, it's going to mean that we're we're becoming a, a heightened version of who we are. There you go. And and so this program teaches that. Now, in my experience. I've made my money in the micro cap stock market or the areas of, you know, bringing new ideas to market in the great American dream in the capitalistic sense, and then leveraging that in the markets. So I've had to raise a lot of money, but it's had to create a lot of value. And typically over time, my deals have created a 5X value over and above the money I've raised. So about 142 million plus and about 14 million of my own cash that I made along the way put back into my deals and yielded out at the heights of the market in the closer to 562 million range, which is about a five times a return. Mm -hmm. And you know what that takes is it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude, it takes great planning, but it takes understanding the mechanics of wealth creation. It it takes understanding that you know money is really the good of all things when used the right way, not the, the root of evils. The globalists or the people in charge of the stuff uh, have largely been able to take money from people and, and take advantage of people without their knowledge, mostly, uh, because they understand the principles of loving money and aggregating wealth and wealth creation. Now, they go beyond, and there's, there's a lot of crime in those realms, uh, that really don't fit this this particular discussion. But what they do fit is the understanding that to simply get a lot of wealth creation and move the balance of good over to those that will do good things, you first have to have a love of money, like right at the baseline. 
you have to have a love of money and all the good they create. But a lot of the messages that have been given out, money doesn't grow on trees, it's the root of all evil, on and on and on. It creates a lot of negative connotations that we're associating with money in the background of our psyche. And it's working against us because here's the most important and most profound thing about the wealth component of Formula 4 that I received. Uh, All resources are infinite. They're not finite. There's no finite nature to wealth creation any more than there is to atomic particles or to happiness. Happiness occurs when you feel completely healthy, when you're completely, happiness is not a state of mind to be self-imposed. That doesn't really work for, except for very brief periods. You know, laughter creates the body chemistry that you need. So those with a sense of humor will live longer, be healthier, have a greater experience. That's just the nature of it. And it's so valuable to understand that uh, wealth creation comes about because all of things in the universe are infinite. And globalists or people that are in charge of a lot of the money or the oppression of the masses have gotten people to believe that they're a finite universe of wealth and resources controlled by them to oppress you. And so if you believe that that's the case, and if that's your message, you know, they always take advantage of me or politicians are stealing our stuff or whatever negative message you have, it is creating that universe that you experience. How does somebody pull themselves out of it and have great success when they come from seemingly no background and poverty and whatever? Well, quite clearly, they don't follow that. They believe money's good and they want to do what it takes to achieve that. Now, I would also argue that no successful person that I would look to would uh, earn my respect if they didn't walk the talk and you know back everything they said with real world examples but also that you know that they understand that wealth creation and wealth uh, um, transmission is one of uh, a required element of our success and they always think if they're successful by my book or by what I learned they think both not instead of okay both means I work really hard to achieve these successful financial goals, but I spend all the time I need with my family to pay attention, to pay attention to them and give them the good love that they uh, uh, are uplifted by and that make their lives better. And I uh, may be successful in business, but I also take time for myself to enjoy all the little things, to smell the flowers, to be active and play sports if I like that to stop and and see movies or to purely relax. In other words, any of these components is not effective without the other components. And nothing should be at the sacrifice of another component. So we learn the simple mechanics, how to instantly do all those things by simply changing the way we speak based on the way we think and support it with feelings. And my one protege asked me, what's the biggest key to your success? living on earth today. And I said, well, have you noticed how many times I say, I really love this person or this thing or this invention or this device or, you know, this experience. And he said, well, no, only that you say that about every single thing all day long. And I said, well, okay. I filled up all my time and space with what I want, like, and love. And it's a principle in the work called the replacement, uh, the replacement model. And that is, Best said this way, uh, like Buckminster Fuller tried to say in almost the perfect words, but this improves upon it. That is that you never change the existing reality by fighting it. Mm -hmm. Think about that. You never change the existing reality by fighting it or fighting against it. Instead, you put a new model in its place, which is so much better and so perfect that it makes the old one completely obsolete. The new model is so perfect and so good that it makes the old model completely obsolete. So it just falls off. And just falling off, you're not fighting against this so that it has to keep being sent to you so you can keep fighting against it. You know, stop war. Well, that's going to get you more war so you keep trying to stop it. If you if you really want to say, have a peaceful world, then celebrate peace. Okay. If you want people to not be poor and homeless and starving, don't feed them and walk away. You are not, you're helping them achieve abject poverty. 
and you're thinking in terms of abject poverty, even though you may feel it made you feel a little better. If you really want to do it, then 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 show them how to be successful, uplift them in such a way they can do this. If somebody's not feeling good, don't feel sorry for them. Pray for them to feel the love for great health, because if you focus on their uh, uh, their ill health, you're actually helping them be sicker. Mm -hmm. They can experience you feeling worried for them or sorry for them, and it it depreciates their health. Okay. So most of what people do is the opposite of what we should be doing. That's what I learned from Formula 4. And I've applied this in business like my current business, Max D, is an audio tech in high definition. And we have it now as a, a biometric audio patent that dynamically will deal with voice. You'd think that if they have fingerprint, facial recognition, eye recognition, uh, that voice, which has already got speech recognition, should have an algorithm that protects or or uh, covers over the voice and can have it coded and decoded with that special algorithm, that dynamic algorithm that MaxD offers. And our company, by applying all these principles, has gone from years of hard development with struggle and criticism and all sorts of things to stay with a situation where now. In the last, uh, how many weeks? I don't know, went up 9,000%. And so so I did a little calculation. A person that had a $10,000 investment in it in uh, in the last three months could have cashed out uh, in the last couple of days for, I think, 190000 or something, some very good amount. So, and that I believe will go up a lot more as we, for the first time, start talking about sales that we're finally getting after years of building it on, trying to do that, getting on a lot of places like Qualcomm chips where we could build that, and then getting involved in lawsuits against guys like Google that are taking everybody's stuff wrongly and using it as their entire business model. And, and now having a combination of all those things now coming to fruition, but it takes a lot of uh, intestinal fortitude that most people don't have. And through this material in the wealth creation, we learn there's a whole 40 minute business discussion that explains the mechanics of building this stuff and how to build it quickly and how to manifest the results you want and the wealth creation that you want by doing something that helps others or is good for the planet. And so that's what the Max D does. And now we're adding a lot of things that can leverage off the Max D brand name. Uh, global intellectual property distribution, um, you know, music in all forms. We found that people that hear it have a transformative music experience or hearing experience. So I tend to get involved in those things that are reflective of the things that I want, like, and love. And so that I get more of those out in the universe and I get more positive feedback to the things that I'm trying to accomplish. And it, it goes over well every time internally which is where you have to reflect it, right? So those are the core elements of what I'm doing. And for people that want to take a look at Max D, they'll learn about possibly a, a great investment opportunity, but they'll also learn how a great investment opportunity or a business can be built in such a way that it can be done very rapidly and with the right messaging can produce an amazing result of real financial accomplishment. And I just want to say too, that uh, when I looked into Max D, it had... Uh, uh, definitely uh, appealed to me uh, being such a, well, sound has been such an integral part of my career. And to sum it up very briefly, it uh, enhances audio because there's a lot of loss in audio. When something is converted into an MP3, it's compressed. And so you do lose a lot of that uh, data, that fidelity so that it's, uh, well, you know, transportable because then otherwise WV files would take up uh, a person's phone in a matter of like three, you know, three episodes or something like that. And what's what stuck out to me about it is beyond the, uh, the this consumer application that it also has the potential to really revitalize sound that has been either lost or damaged over time one way or another, whether it's sound from like, I don't know, World War I footage that could be restored or uh, even uh, in, in, investigatory, in an investigatory uh, standpoint where, say, there's a sound recording that could make or break a case. Um, and, and solve a crime of some sort by restoring the data might actually reveal something. And I'm just wondering if any of that has uh, crossed your mind or if it was just started as a consumer product and then 
or is you started with a technology first and figured out how to brand it? Well, the, we started with the the original creator of the worst first working surround sound created this technology that dynamically expands the range as it's moving. So if you look at maxd.audio under the demo site, you'll see a Miranda Lambert song on I think ABC, and you'll see at the bottom the uh, the parametric and uh, graphic equalizer that's moving as a waveform in the room as it moves every time the technology's shut on and off. And then you'll see a spatial characteristics generator that's also in the room showing, you know, how sound is moving in a 3D sense in the room. And you'll see that with it on and off again. And so it started as a technology, a pure technology that dynamically restored these MP3s and what you're calling badly crushed audio into a, a more real live format of the original instrumentation that sound like that it does. And it did it so well, in fact, that if you look at the uh, on the site under advisory, uh, you'll see the advisory board, which is a lot of famous people in the music and audio industries from m- movies and music uh, across the full spectrum. And so uh, it's now coming into play a dramatic result of effectiveness where people are realizing, uh, you know, what is that and how do I get it? Uh, I pay thousands of dollars to put it in my car stereo. I'm having a better experience. I need to have this added to whatever audio experience I'm having, but it's clearly, I can feel it in my body. They're saying things that people don't say about audio. Mm -hmm. And we did it as an also. So we did a Venice Beach challenge on the Venice Beach boardwalk in in, uh, Los Angeles area uh, or Santa Monica area, where people going around in their skateboards and up and down the beach were given a, in a booth, a set of headphones, Beats. Bose, Sony, three major brands. And in every case, they said that they would prefer that with the Max D on in those headphones, it dramatically improved the experience to where they want to know, how do I get that right now? And so everybody was asked a simple question. Would you, would that cause you to make a consumer buying decision for the product you were buying if you knew it had Max D versus it didn't? And they said absolutely 100% of the time. And then we took it to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas uh, a few years back, and we participated with Qualcomm's promotion of the chip. And we had a big screen, and we showed it in a car. One of our people had a Mercedes, uh, the the sports car, the 450, whatever. And they played it on and off with just an amp. And people said that they would be willing to spend up to $5,000 to add to that to their car stereo, which was kind of remarkable. Um, but obviously, when people drive, their audio is very important to them. And that just turned out to be a pretty amazing uh, uh, situation. So we've had all those situations with the audio, and we've added other technology uses to that platform that are now getting to be some uh, recognition in the market. And as that's reflected, this is the first time you're going to see the effect on our stock after we announced sales and profits and other things with brand names and major stars that we didn't have before. We had some, but nothing that tied it all together or created that business opportunity. Now that's now coming together. So the timeliness of it is pretty exciting. Well, Greg, uh, usually we go for an hour, but uh, we're coming up on an hour, almost an hour and 30 minutes. Um, Cause I just, I mean, for me, this has just been an experience and it's a one of a kind experience that I just wanted to like, well, I was going to say sit back, but I actually stand when I do this. So to just like stand back, lean back against the wall, and just like take it in. Um, but I, I gotta, I gotta put on a, uh, I gotta put on a plug. <laughs> I, I gotta, I, I gotta wrap this up. Uh, much to my dismay, but we gotta do it. So uh, I'll give you a couple more minutes just to let people know um, what are some steps that they should take immediately to look into your content and to start getting involved into learning more about what it is that you have to say. Well, what I have to say is extended from the Formula 4 site, and most of my fulfillment of my mission in this life at this time on Earth to contribute to the successful moving forward on Earth rather than the the eugenicist-type programs that are going on around the world, and and is to create a better world, each person starting with themselves. And if you look at the responses to Formula 4, they're all evolutionary. Literally, people after five or 10 minutes of the content are, are saying incredible things. And you can find 
you know, there's nothing better than a consumer or customer endorsing or testimonializing your product. And we've had so much of it, unlike anything that's ever been seen. It's truly gratifying to know the level of good work that people are able to do because of it. So I'd say if people go to Formula mm-hmm. 4 Protocol, that's formula, the word, and the number four, and the word P-R-O, protocol, P-R-O-T-O-C-O-L.com, they can get right into the content. And we have some free content like Candy Sampler called Level Up, and then we have all the other programs. And you'll be able to see um, – for each thing, some really important information that will give you the ability to decide which programs might be a starting point for you. It'll be very clear uh, where to start on that program. And the content, expect that, you know, we have the 100-year guarantee of, you know, having the great result that the the content promises, really. And so if people use it, they're going to find instant improvement. In other words, there's an old saying, if you want to, if you want to, have success, you have to do successful things. If you're not happy with your life, you have to change things you're doing. If you're not happy with the results you're producing, you have to change the things you're doing to produce those results. And Formula 4, without any learning curve, will cover all aspects of what people know about life skills training or life hacks, whatever you want to call it. And it puts them there in real time. There's no learning curve. All they got to do is watch and listen. And that's profound because Everything else, you have to first get an understanding and then try the whatever it is that you have to do or learn or know over time in order to get that perfect result. So that's the first thing. The second thing that people might want to do if they want to see my current business ventures, go to maxd.audio. Symbol on over the counter is M-A-X-D, Mary Alpha X-Ray David. Maxd.audio is the website. And there you can see demos and the background for the technology that we're using. And who's endorsing it? A lot of big people are on the advisory that they can find out. So this would be very helpful. We've also had various different apps we've come out with for consumers. And we've taken down the recent apps, but we're putting together new apps now. We've had almost a million downloads of apps with zero promotion and marketing efforts. So really clear that the people are looking for a potentially better experience. And with MaxD, we think they'll find it. So they'll find that and also the opportunity to to invest and sort of get what I call the super lotto ticket effect. Something in the micro cap space costs significantly less. More, Many more shares can be accumulated for far less money with a much higher up of potential if we achieve any measure of success. Now, there's no guarantees in the stock market, but what there is a guarantee in that, you know, that we definitely have produced something that is got an amazing experience to people. So I would say definitely look at the demos and see how good they are. And we're going to have some others up there soon that show people that have tested it in those Pepsi challenge type of modes. So a lot of good things going on. I'd say to people, check out that maxd.audio as well. And look at the investment too, because you can buy a lot of shares for very inexpensively at a penny. It's something that my last stock went from $0.03 cents to $9 on high volume after a year and a half. But right now, everything moves faster. So we see those growths occurring a lot sooner and then leveling off. And the best of that is yet to come for people. So those that uh, buy their drink, the Kool-Aid, as we say, and are interested should look at it for uh, a a small consumer investment. Terrific. Well, listeners, uh, there's, there's plenty here to to do plenty here to take in. And if you want to, as always, if you have any feedback, you can always uh, contact podcast at debutify.com. Be more than happy to hear uh, what's going on. And, uh, Greg, this is like I, I said, this was transformative and I can't think of a better word for it than that. So I will go with that. Uh, so thank you once more for your time. Hey, audience, Joseph here, following up with you after the recording. Greg and his team shared part of the Formula 4 protocol, and I've been going through the program. Fullness of self is a critical aspect of success in my belief. And what I find most compelling about the program is how it lays out the path to rebuild ourselves in a way that leads us to this fulfillment. It also takes a level-headed approach to viewing options at our disposal. For instance, in talking about medicine, Greg takes a critical look at both modern medicine as well as natural practices and explains what would be a balanced and sensible approach to using them. And that's just one example. Have a look at the program for yourself. What you'll find about the structure is that the health program is the first part of it. And so that alone, I think, will provide enough insight that if you feel ready to move on to the next part of the program, you can. But the health program alone will 
provide you with a lot of important information to re help you reevaluate how you live your life. And it's knowledge well worth the acquisition. Thanks for listening. You might have found this show on many number of platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive, please take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you, so whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, head over to debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next. <laughs>